I don't think we're live yet. There we are. Hi everybody, I'm Renza Shabilia and I'm here from Diabetes Australia and welcome back to our Facebook Lives. We've had a little bit of a break, but we're back after a couple of weeks off and I'm so, so delighted to be joined by Dr. John Wentworth today. John, how are you? Pretty well, actually, thanks. Thank you so, so much for joining us today. I'm absolutely thrilled to have you here, John. So John is a researcher who works at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute and the Royal Melbourne Hospital. So a fellow Melbourneian also in lockdown. Um, John, tell us a little bit about yourself, please. So thanks, thanks for having me on, Renza. Um, I'm a diabetes specialist at the Royal Melbourne Hospital and spend about half of my time at the neighbouring Walter and Eliza Hall Institute working with a team of people who are trying to prevent young children and adults developing type 1 diabetes. So the, the, the broad concept is that type 1 diabetes is caused or it happens because the immune system attacks the pancreas so that it loses the ability to make insulin. And that immune attack happens gradually and slowly and over many years. And it doesn't become obvious usually until someone needs to take insulin because they get very sick. And rather than treat it as a metabolic problem, which is what we've been doing for the last hundred years, well, not quite 100 years, but uh, 70 odd years, um, yeah. uh, we, we've, we're choosing to treat it as an immune problem. And so that means identifying people in whom this immune problem is occurring um, well before their blood sugars become abnormal and then um, working out if and how we can intervene to stop that happening. Right, okay. So when we talk about prevention and diabetes, and we have those two words together, we're always talking about type two. But so this is really interesting, because I know that, um, you know, every time somebody says you can prevent diabetes, people jump in very quickly and say, you mean type two diabetes. What is that pathway to prevention of type one? How does that look? Well, um, we don't know for sure, because we're still, um, we're still in the early phases. Um, but essentially, it's, it's targeting the immune system rather than the metabolic problems that largely cause type 2 diabetes. And, and by that, I mean obesity and the extra strain that obesity puts on the pancreas. So in type 2 diabetes, um, if you are overweight and we can see that the sugar levels are sort of gradually drifting up, um, we know that if you can shed 5 or 10% of your body weight through diet and exercise, that you'll protect yourself from getting type 2 diabetes. But in type 1 diabetes, most of the time people are not overweight when they're developing it and diagnosed with it. Uh, and um, lifestyle modification, whilst important for all of us, is, is not really a very powerful way to prevent it happening. So we need to identify, uh, we need to learn a lot more about how the immune system causes the disease. Um, but we also need to learn about how best to use quite a number of different drugs we have that do affect the immune system. Um, but because they affect the immune system, they're also somewhat hazardous. And so we need to learn when might be the best time to use them and in, you know, who are the best people to receive them and how to do it safely. Right. So tell us a little bit how, okay, so if somebody has type 1 themselves, I live with type 1. Um, I have a 15-year-old daughter. One of the things that I have, I guess, been very concerned about as a parent is um, me passing on my, what I refer to as my um, dodgy genes, to my daughter. So what sort of things can people who have type 1 in the family, what should they be thinking about with this sort of research? Can we get involved? Absolutely. And in fact, we are reaching out to families with type 1 diabetes to help advance the cause, um, because we know that unaffected family members are about a 15 fold greater risk of getting type 1 diabetes than other people in the general population. And so it enables us to um, identify people a little more easily who are at risk. Now we do that um, currently through a blood test for antibodies. And these antibodies tell us that the immune system is attacking the pancreas. They occur often a decade before people actually get sick and have high blood sugars and, and need to use insulin. So there's this large window of opportunity to prevent the disease. And it's through that window that we've tested and we continue to test a number of agents, the most promising of which uh, was announced about this time last year, a, a drug called teplizumab, which 
um, was given to children and young adults who were on the cusp of developing a need to use insulin. They were given this immune therapy that targeted a, a type of immune cell and took it out of the circulation, out of the blood, and delayed the need to use insulin by about two years. So that was a that was a terrific proof of concept that we can safely come in with an immune therapy to make a difference. But uh, we, we, we want to build on that and, and do a lot better. And the only way we can do that is by identifying at-risk people who want to get involved. Um, and and that's, that's quite a mission. Um, if we take relatives, if we take family members, about one in 20 of them will test positive for one or more antibodies that we look for. But only about one in 30 or one in 40 of them will have a sufficiently high risk profile to warrant some sort of intervention. So we need to screen a lot of people to identify those at risk and those who we can potentially help. And so that's why we're, uh, we're, we're, we're spreading our arms wide. And in fact, we've, we have a network that operates throughout Australia and New Zealand um, for antibody screening for people who have, have a family member with type 1 diabetes and who are aged between two and 30 years old. Okay. All right. Now, um, we're going to, so just for everybody who's watching, we're going to put down, um, have all of the information about how people can get involved and find out more. And they will be in the comments throughout this chat. So um, keep coming back to that. And of course, the way that these chats work best is when they're interactive. So please do feel free to ask questions. And excuse me while I'm quickly looking at my phone, but I do have a question, John, that I'd like yep. to read out to you. A question from Rebecca. She says she has four children and she's done India studies that show they show no antibodies. Great. Um, which is great. Um, uh, so, so what happens though now? What does that mean? Does that mean that's it? No need to think about it again? What happens it's next? A, it, that's a great sign. It, it almost means that. Um, right, okay. We, we certainly know antibodies. So the NDIA study is, is similar to the current program we're running more generally called type one screen. Um, the NDIA study is looking at babies and young children. So. Um, we know that if you find antibodies in a child aged one to three years, that that's quite, a, that's quite a problematic situation and there's quite a high likelihood that by age 10, that child will have type 1 diabetes. But there are many children and young adults who we believe develop their antibodies a bit later in life. Um, and I guess if your children are still under the age of five, um, it might pay to have another test, even though they're clear around age six or seven, something like that. And again, if they're clear at that age, then really the risk is back to the general population, you know, one in 400 or even lower. So um, that, that would be a terrific sign. So I think it's a terrific sign that there are no antibodies um, at this stage. Um, and if they continue to test negative in India, then, um, I would I would leave them alone for a bit and, and then maybe <laughs> yeah. get a get a test done a bit later on just before adolescence. Can you tell us what does a test involve? Because I think that yes, that's yeah. often perhaps something that people might be a bit reluctant about. They are worried about yeah. their child having to have a blood test, for example. Yeah, um, yeah. So and this is and we're, we're very mindful of that, and we are working um, with a group based in San Francisco who are developing a blood spot test, but um, that that we need to sort that out, but that probably won't be ready until end of next year or the year after. So we're, we're taking steps to do that. But currently the test unfortunately does require a blood sample. Um, and so you need to have a phlebotomist, a blood collector, um, put a needle in a little vein and, and to take a blood sample. And that um, in skilled hands is actually fairly straightforward. Um, and, and much of the problem, particularly in children aged three to 10 is, is the, the precognition, the, the, the worry and the thought of, of having the needle. But it is a hassle and you do need to go somewhere to get it done. And you often need to bribe your child before and or after it. Um, and, um, and, and we can understand that's a, that's a big problem for some people. Um, th th there's another assay that again is looking interesting which is looking at saliva based testing as okay. well and um you know we, we we're hoping to to sort all this out in coming years um because that's a major issue particularly with COVID as well um it's completely understandable particularly in melbourne that people don't want to go anywhere near a, a blood collector and um although they are following very good protocols um, i can sympathize with that view um 
Uh, but um, in general terms, um, you know, the, the blood collection services in the community are very safe from a COVID point of view. And, uh, and I can vouch for that with the many thousands of patients I've had have tests for other things, have, have no real qualms with it. And we haven't seen any significant cross infection from phlebotomy sites uh, into the general population. So I think it's relatively safe, but certainly very reasonable, particularly in Melbourne to wait and, you know, another few weeks until the numbers come down before you head out for a test if you want to get yeah. your little one tested. Yeah, but that is reassuring to know that, I mean, mm. things are very safe in, in any setting, but I know that, I, you know, I had to have a, an eye doctor appointment a couple of weeks ago and so many precautions being taken. So that is certainly reassuring. Now, I have a question from, from SB who says, um, has type 1 but doesn't have any children, would it be prudent to have nieces or nephews tested um, and that they're the only person currently in their family, and hopefully yeah. not only so currently, with diabetes? So our view, would, our answer would be yes. I mean, we, we've um, we've structured this. So, so a niece and nephew has a slightly lower risk than a son or daughter if you had one, but but the risk is still there and, and elevated above the background. Um, so we would we would be delighted to welcome them on board. Obviously, it's a it's a decision for their parents and their, their family because um, uh, we find that it's it's still a bit. Um, tricky um, really to, to sort of say this is something you must do and, and that's because obviously there's some hassle and discomfort involved with it but also um, there, there are many people who come back to us and say well look what are you doing you know you're telling us we're going to get this disease if we test positive and then you don't really have anything to do that is going to make a massive difference for it I mean you might be able to delay things and, and certainly I guess we could say we could follow you carefully and prevent you getting sick if you do get type 1 diabetes. But um, uh, uh, some people say, well, look, this is, I'm going to wait until you've got the answer before I get involved. Um, but if, right. if the family of, of your nieces and nephews are, are, are sold on what we're trying to do and, and keen to get involved, and I, I guess if you take my word for it, that um, we really do strive to look after each and every person who joins the study to make sure that they do not get sick if they get diabetes and they get opportunities to access immune therapies that are not yet approved, um, then please um, let them have a look at the website. There's a lot of information uh, on our website and, and a contact um, email and phone number if you need further information. Um, but uh, but please direct them that way and, and let them make a decision. We would love to have anyone with a family, yeah. anyone from a diabetes family involved, because we believe what we're doing is good. We're providing good care to people who do test positive, And we are part of this worldwide mission to develop an effective prevention therapy that can be rolled out more generally uh, in the yeah. community in the fullness of time. I think that point about you know people who are enrolled that you're watching them really closely so they don't get very sick um, with diabetes is actually a really significant and really important thing to be concentrating on. Uh, diabetes Australia has run our Four T's campaign where we're trying to educate the broader population about what the symptoms of type one diabetes are, so that people know if you've got these symptoms, go and talk to your, your doctor, get checked for it. Um, because the stories that we hear of people who are diagnosed with type one diabetes really, really unwell. They're not great stories. So having any, you know, any way to, to prevent that is really very important, I would think. Is that um, something that people understand, do you think, um, when, so, when they're in the study? Uh, look, I think that is partly the motivation. I think um, I think most people want to just know, you know, they know the test is good um, and they want to know what the risk is. Uh, and then occasionally when a positive test comes back, that is quite distressing for people and we need to sort of work with them to, to work through that. And so there is evidence that if you do test positive, that will be a bit of a stress, but, but in the longer term, much less of a stress than if you just kept going along and then one day your child got very sick and ended up having to be admitted to hospital with quite severe ketoacidosis. Yes. Um, about one in three kids in Australia at the moment, unfortunately, present with ketoacidosis. As a bit of a spoiler alert, we're just collating our data at the moment, but it looks like far fewer than one in 20 of the kids in the screening programs have ketoacidosis at diagnosis wow. Um, wow. And, uh, and, and, and quite possibly less. We're just trying to, to finalise the numbers now. So I think there's... You know, I think what we'll be able to show is what they've shown around the world is that if you're involved in screening, you don't get sick when you get diagnosed and that, that makes sense. 
Um, uh, the, the other sad thing is that unfortunately, because it's a rare condition relative to a lot of other things, there are many stories of, of families going to their doctor saying, my child is not doing well, they've got a sore throat, they're not thriving, they've lost weight, and they're, they're told it's something else, most likely a viral infection, or you know, we'll just see what happens, come back in a few days. And of course, by that time, they've had to go to hospital and be admitted uh, to have an insulin infusion and all sorts of things. So um, unfortunately, because it's relatively rare and because in general practice, you have to deal with so much um, so many other things and, and it's not top of your mind. There are many stories of misdiagnoses with quite significant consequences. Yeah, we have we have heard so many of those. And I think the first year that we ran the campaign, it wasn't just know the symptoms and go to the doctor. It was know the symptoms. But when you go to the doctor, specifically say, could this be type 1 diabetes? Yeah. Because it, it, that's right, because mm. it's not front of everybody's mind. Perhaps that's mm. not what the first thing that somebody's going to be checked for. Now, I do have a couple of questions, but before right. I get to them, you mentioned that the work that you're doing is across um, or involves centres in Australia and in New Zealand. But is this, you said, you said a couple of times that this is part of a global, yep. um, there's global work going on. So how are you connected with what's going on and where are there other, um, where is there other work that's, you know, quite similar yeah. happening around the world? So, um, well, the, the, the local node is funded by JDRF Australia primarily, um, yep. uh, with some help from JDRF International as well. Um, and uh, it is, it's really a screening platform identifying family members with antibodies and therefore risk of type 1 diabetes. Now, these programs are going elsewhere in the world, in North America, in Europe in particular. Um, and there are, um, there are networks um, centred in the US and centred in um, Europe, uh, in France, I believe, uh, where groups of uh, researchers and clinicians are working to bring um, immune therapies forward, but also to better understand how the immune system is doing the damage as well. So the big two big networks are called TrialNet in North America, and, and that is the network we're part of, and that's the one that ran the Plizumab study and is at the moment the, the, the best placed um, uh, outfit to run further prevention studies, and there are a number that are ongoing at the moment. And then the other node is called Inodia, I-N-N-O-D-I-A, uh, and that um, is based in Paris. And, and that's at the moment just working to better characterise the immune attack, but also um, looking to develop and, uh, protocols for immune therapy as well. I, I guess on the back of all that, and, and quite excitingly, there are also industry partners that are looking to get into this space, um, there are a couple of companies that feel they've got a sufficiently safe and effective drug that could be trialled to prevent diabetes. And, you know, their biggest problem is finding people who would be, um, you know, at risk and therefore able to be helped by them. And, and they're looking at how they might um, get involved in screening programs as well. But there's nothing active happening in, in that space yet. So. Um, TrialNet is the big one, um, Inodia is the other one, and they're both um, philanthropic and, and government funded. Yeah, wonderful. Okay, let me just um, go to our questions. So we've got a question from Dom who says, um, Dom has type 1 and was diagnosed at 24 and is originally from Scotland. Within five years of moving, I guess moving to Australia, um, he developed asthma and five years later um, was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. There's no family history of either. Uh, can environmental yep. changes cause type 1 diabetes? And are there studies um, into this? So what, yeah. what do we have to say about yeah. that? Yeah. Um, so quite possibly. I mean, we, we really can't say for sure, but there's, a, there's quite strong circumstantial evidence there that um, that move to Australia for whatever reason may have triggered something. Um, so, yes, the, 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 the short answer is yes, the environment is critically important. And there's, there's two sort of things to say about that. I mean, um, one is that over the last 50 years, we've seen much, much more type 1 diabetes and, and, and our gene pool hasn't really changed much in that period of time. So you've really got to argue that there's something in the environment that's driving it. Um, and a really classic um, demonstration of this is if you compare rates of type 1 diabetes in genetically similar populations, either in Finland or in neighbouring Russian Karelia, 
where after the war, you know, the population was just, the, the boundaries were just redefined and uh, basically the, the um, you know, similar genetic stock, uh, genetically based communities grew up. Now, Karelia is quite developing and, and not very wealthy. Finland is a developed country. Finland has the highest rate of type 1 diabetes in the world. Karelia has one of the lowest type 1 diabetes rates in the world. So what's going on there? Um, yeah. We think possibly this hygiene hypothesis is the most likely explanation. If you live around dirt and you, you eat somewhat, you know, um, you, you live in less clean environments and eat foods that are not as refined and, and perhaps, you know, have more bacterial contamination or the like, then maybe that's telling your immune system that it needs to tone it down a bit and, and likewise, you know, not attack your own body as much as it might in, in Finland. That's one explanation for it. But, but that's, so certainly the environment's important and, and that's what this NDIA study, E-N-D-I-A study is trying to do. Um, it's trying to work out, we think this environment is acting um, very, very early in life and possibly during pregnancy. And so this NDIA study has recruited 1500 families um, we've had all the babies born now and we're following um, people through to see what it is in the environment throughout Australia and in different areas that might be associated with the development of type 1 diabetes. Okay, so we will put up details of India because, so people can just see what the information is because they're not recruiting anymore now. No, un unfortunately not. Yeah. Well, yeah. fortunately and fortunately, yeah. Yeah. we would have loved to have kept it going, but um, yeah. uh, and and uh, all those India, I'm sure there's a few India participants listening in at the moment. I mean, sure. yes. we're, we're yeah. incredibly grateful for the effort that they've made because it's, it's a really heroic uh, performance all around, yeah. really. Yeah, absolutely. But and it, it is something for people just to keep on top, you know, to keep up with and to keep reading about. It is really interesting. So we've got a question from Alex. Alex has type 1 diabetes of 46 years. But there is no one in Alex's extended family with type 1. Yeah. Alex has three children and now grandchildren. Um, is it possible that her children and grandchildren, sorry, Alex, I don't know if it's Alex, he or she, is it possible yeah. that Alex um, could have passed this on to family yeah. members? So um, yeah, so it can. Um, so uh, look, the, the reality is that uh, about 85% of children diagnosed with type 1 diabetes do not have a family member oh, with type 1 there. diabetes. Yep. Okay, so um, the reason we are targeting families is because it makes our job easier. Of course, um, yeah. But but it doesn't. Uh, but if we had the resources, we would test every five-year-old kid in Australia, um, mm -hmm. because we know that we're only picking up fifteen percent of future diagnoses when we we do what we do. So, yes, even though it's not in your family, Alex, um, it could be there in your children. Um, and and this is because there are a few key genes that you can pass down to your kids. And we know that they carry risk, but it's clearly something else needs to trigger the disease, something presumably in the environment that acts through the genes to cause the disease. So um, it's quite likely that one or more of your kids and grandchildren have those genes and therefore their risk would be higher than the general population and an antibody test would sort out whether they're at risk or not. And so please get on board, have a look, see if, uh, see if they wanna get tested. Okay, so John, help. let's talk a little bit about what the process is if somebody enrolls in the study. Um, so they've, they've mm -hmm. decided that they're going to, they've made the decision, their kid's happy to do it, um, or, you know, older, because it's up to 30, so it's not only young, young kids. Um, can, you, can we talk a little bit about what happens? They, they have their blood test and it comes back positive. What, what does that mean? And what are the next steps then beyond that? So, so I might just take a quick step back and just talk people through the whole process. So the Wonderful website, so we need to, this is a research study, so we need to consent people for it. And so um, although we're in an electronic age, we actually need people to download a form, sign a page and scan it and send it back to us. Um, and so there's a consent process, which is all doable through the website by downloading a form and getting it back to us. Then we send out a link to complete a 10 minute survey so that we can capture the basic details and the contact details for the person being screened. And, and we also send out a form to get a blood test in the community. And so we've got links throughout Australia and New Zealand where that can happen. Um, and so um, you do the survey, you get your form and when, you, when the time's right, you go and get the blood test. The blood sample is shipped to Melbourne 
the antibody tests are done in batches. Within six weeks, we get the result and we communicate it straight back to you. Now, if it's negative, you get an email. And if it's positive, we call you up and we tell you what it means uh, and what we should do. And, and at the moment, we're um, being a little bit cautious, I guess, and we're, we're saying um, to most people with antibodies, even if they have a single antibody and therefore don't have a particularly increased risk of diabetes, we, we're encouraging people, again, for free, to go and get a glucose test to check that their glucose tolerance is normal. And um, if, you, um, if you test um, positive for antibodies, we can then discuss the various intervention studies we're doing to try to prevent disease. And the, the two that are actually, sorry, there's only one running at the moment because of COVID, but, um, and yeah. would you believe it's trialing a tablet called hydroxychloroquine, which oh. you might have heard of recently. <laughs> Um, okay. And we were worried a few months ago that the world stocks of hydroxychloroquine would have been sort of all warehoused in the US, but um, uh, the, the, the study's still going quite nicely. And um, uh, in this, this study, um, which was recruiting fantastically until COVID and, and has about worldwide, I think, you know, we're looking for another 50 to 60 participants out of a total of 200 or so. Um, uh, this this study is a daily tablet um, looking to see if you can delay the progression of diabetes and, and keep the blood glucose levels normal. Um, the, the other studies, um, we've got one that's currently running. We're going to have results for next year where we used a, a drug we used for rheumatoid arthritis called um, Abatacept. And that's going to be really interesting because um, it's a very safe treatment very well tolerated. And uh, if it shows a, a benefit, I think could quite reasonably be rolled out fairly quickly. Um, and then we have a, a, a study on ice at the moment for kids and young adults who are getting very close to diagnosis because their blood sugar levels are going up a bit after the, the blood test. And, and that study is, is just not, not a great option in the COVID era. So we need to really wait until either the numbers settle down or we have an effective vaccine before we, we dust that one off and, and get it ready. So, so that's what's happening from a prevention point of view. But also, um, you know, you, you get, actually you get my phone number um, when you test positive. Um, we link you up, if you live in Western Australia, we link you up with the Perth Children's Hospital. We, we tell you that if you have a concern that you're, you, you or your child are, are getting diabetes, that you let us know immediately and we steer you through the system to make sure that you can get sorted out. And, um, you know, we've got plenty of examples. I mean, the, the, the most salient one that comes to mind is uh, someone rang up from, uh, from uh, Hobart and they said, look, I took my child in to the Royal Hobart Hospital. The sugar was 26. And they said, oh, well, you know, don't worry about it. And, uh, you know, we'll, 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 we'll sort it out a bit later. And uh, um, we, 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 we got, um, we actually got the sibling, we, we got them to put a new needle on the sibling's insulin pen and we actually gave the first dose of insulin over the phone um, right. and, and sorted out a pediatrician within a couple of days um, to, to sort that out. And, um, and we, had the, we, we had the luxury of having one of those glucose um, monitors on the arm for the child as well. So that I, was, I was having a look at some data being beamed in as well. So um, we, 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 we act, um, we, we really are passionate about making sure people are looked after if, if trouble arises. Yeah. So that's what I happens actually, if you're positive. Yeah, yeah yes. But um, I think that that's just, you know, looking after people, you know, when there's so many concerns. I wanted to ask though, is part of it um, being referred, because I know that for a lot of people, this really would be emotionally quite overwhelming. Um, are people able to speak to a counsellor or to a psychologist either as part of your program or is that something that you can assist people with if, um, if that's something that, that you feel might, or they feel might be of, of use to them while they're, while they're dealing with this? Yeah, so look, unfortunately, we don't have any formal psychology support, but we do have ourselves and we do have connections to various health providers, including the general practitioner and, and yeah. other clinics. So I think, look, um, you know, I think it's a really important thing to consider before you jump into this to, to think about how you would feel if, it, if the test became positive. Thankfully, we haven't had, you know, major issues with people really, um, you know, becoming incredibly upset and, and, you know, highly anxious because of the results. Um, uh, uh, we, we, as I say, we will try to deal with that as best we can ourselves and then try to refer through the general 
community pathways, usually through general practice to, to, to manage that. Um, but uh, yes, it can be upsetting. Um, and I think talking through, I, I, I think that the, the message that helps most is, 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 is knowing that, you know, knowledge is power. So you, you're now empowered to do something if you see some symptoms and you've got a lifeline, if, you know, back to us if, if there are problems. Um, but also that it does provide an opportunity to get involved in the prevention as well and, and to make a bit of a difference either for the individual or for the, the greater community. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just to everybody who's watching, if you've got any last minute questions, you should get them to us because we, we haven't got much longer. But I have, a, I have got a couple of comments here that I would like to read out. So we've got one from Brendan who says, um, he was diagnosed at 11, family history caught up later with his father being diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in his 70s. Um, and it was initially misdiagnosed as type 2 diabetes, which happens quite a bit. Yeah, so, and you at know, 70, I, yeah, at 70, I guess the GP was probably not even thinking that type 1 could have been something to no, consider. And, no, and, um, you know, it, this sort of goes to, you know, that we don't really understand what the hell's going on with type 1 diabetes. Presumably, yeah. you know, your father lived in a different era, different environmental cues, um, and maybe there was something there. Um, but um, yeah, no, we, I, I can't can't explain it um, any better than that. But sure, I mean, it's it's certainly understandable in the context of family risk. Yeah, absolutely. And Steve says this is great research that you're doing. I will check your website and drag the kids to get the antibody blood test. Dragging, inviting, well, I don't know, yeah. driving, yeah. whatever it takes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and look, I mean, but to be fair, I'm, I, I guess it's not appropriate at the moment with the COVID numbers in Victoria, but certainly in Melbourne, um, you know, when things settle down, it's it's very possible to come into the Royal Melbourne Hospital where we have some very skilled um, people who, um, you know, we've got, you have a look at some of the photos on our website anyway, we've had, uh, we, we, we get plenty of shots of people with needles in their arms and a big smile on their face. So um, it, it, there's, some, there's some skilled operators um, but they're also all up throughout the community as well. We can sort of try and direct you to one, you know, throughout Australia that's going to look after you. Absolutely. Now, what I want to talk about a little bit was the fact, now you mentioned that there has been one drug um, therapy that you've used that showed a delay of about two years. Is that right? That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about that. I mean, two years delaying type 1 diabetes seems pretty significant to me. I mean, I think that, you know, I would have, you know, a month, two months, three months, whatever, yeah, sure. any opportunity to delay is really valuable. Is that is that the general message that we should be sharing about that? Well, the, I mean, the big problem is that this drug um, is under wraps because um, it's that it's it's owned by a drug company. So we, we when we did the trial, we were, had access to drug, um, and we were allowed to do the trial to test whether it worked. Um, and now the company is trying to get it ready for market. And so it is undergoing further studies to meet regulatory approval. Mm -hmm. And it will probably emerge as a treatment for people who are newly diagnosed with type 1 diabetes because that's, they're easy to find and that's a much bigger market for the company. But it will... Um, uh, I think also, you know, be, if it's available generally, then we'd be able to use it for prevention as well. Now, the biggest problem we're going to have initially, if there's only one drug in the market, is it's going to be heinously expensive. And so we're going to have to wait till there's a few other players um, out there. Um, now, this, this drug was pretty straightforward. It, it worked by targeting immune cells called lymphocytes. And it decreased the, the lymphocyte counts in the blood and, and somehow seemed to sort of interfere with the progressive attack on the pancreas um, that is caused by these, these lymphocytes. And when the lymphocyte counts recovered after six or 12 months, it seemed like in many people, things were sort of back to a steady state and there was less attack on the pancreas. Now, um, the, the, the side effects of the drug, the drug was sort of so the drug was given in an intensive two-week um, uh, exposure where right at the start of the trial, everyone had 14 straight days of an infusion through a vein of this drug. So it was quite intense treatment. Mm -hmm. um, and then people were just followed. So it was quite heavy-handed immune therapy in a, in, a, in a concerted period of time, and then we followed. Now, 
The main side effect, um, apart from those lymphocytes going down, was that some people got a bit of a rash and, and viral type symptoms. Um, uh, and, and apart from that, it looked pretty good. Um, we think um, it would probably be more effective if we could retreat people you know, every year or, or two years. And so that is one thought out there that maybe the next protocols should be looking to give repeated treatment. But I guess the, the, the bigger concern about this medication is that we don't really have a firm view of safety in many, many people because the trial only involves 76 people. Um, that's a small number. You, you, you'll never identify very rare side effects and you'll never um, really have a good sense that its long-term safety is okay in 10, 15, 20 years. Um, we, although we are accumulating a bit of data with that drug as well. So I think things will evolve here. Um, one of the great hopes is that there are a lot of drugs currently used to treat rheumatoid arthritis that we have a much better handle about safety um, of, of these drugs. And so, and some of these are being worked up to be put into prevention trials as well. And so I think, you know, in the near future, we'll have a bit more information, including about this abatacept drug that is, is going to be announced um, next year, hopefully, um, that, that, that will guide us um, so that we can say a bit more about how confident we are about the long-term safety of these agents as well. So rheumatoid arthritis is another autoimmune condition, just like type 1 diabetes is. So is there a connection between the two, those two conditions specifically, why the, there, there seems to be um, both, you know, the drugs working for both conditions? Uh, well, no, well it's, I guess the, the commonality is that they are autoimmune diseases. So the body's immune system is attacking the body by mistake. That's essentially what an autoimmune disease is. And I guess similar immune functions, including these lymphocytes, you know, are, are playing a role. But they, they, they're distinct in many other ways as well. And the, the risk genes are very different between rheumatoid arthritis and, um, and type 1 diabetes. Um, I guess the other thing about rheumatoid arthritis is that it's much more aggressive immune manifestation. I mean, you know, the, the, when you have rheumatoid arthritis, your joint swells up and it's pretty hard to miss. Um, you know, you get a painful swollen joint. Now, um, you don't get a swollen pancreas in type 1 diabetes, and you certainly don't get a painful swollen pancreas in type 1 diabetes. So I think the intensity of the immune attack is also a bit different um, in the two diseases. But, but nonetheless, um, there's enough commonality there for us to feel it's worth testing these agents. And as I say, there are some promising early findings. Now, John, we're going to wrap up, and I'm going to ask you a question that I bet you hate being asked. Every day I've been watching the um, the uh, Premier um, oh, yeah. give his conferences and people ask questions and every time I yell at the TV, he doesn't have a crystal ball. But I'm going to ask yeah. you as if you have a crystal ball right now. Yeah. What, what does the future look like for type 1 diabetes? When are we going to get to a point where we will be able to have therapies and treatments available that can delay, prevent, can, you know, really make a difference so that people are not getting type 1 diabetes? Is that something yeah. that... We're thinking well, it's going to happen. Look, it will happen. I mean, the, the, the problem with type 1 diabetes, say, compared to rheumatoid arthritis, for instance, is that the, the, the time frames we're talking about are quite long. And mm -hmm. cancer is another example. I mean, you know, they, they sorted out pediatric leukemia in the 50s um, because, you know, it was such a devastating disease and they, had, they could see very easily when something worked or not. When we when we talk about prevention in type 1 diabetes, we often need to go for five years in these trials and it's relatively difficult for us to see what's happening um, you know, in, in a really um, detailed manner to the attack on the pancreas, the immune attack on the pancreas. So one of the great needs we have is, is a better way to measure that, the intensity of that immune attack and, and how our therapies are working. So I guess our timeframes are a bit different, but in terms of getting there, I mean, I think we can get there. We just need to do the clinical research to get there. And that, that's very difficult. It's obviously very expensive. It's obviously you've got to have access to the right drugs and drug companies generally are the ones that have these. And so we have to set up arrangements with them that allow academic outfits to, to test them. And most importantly, we need people to come along with us um, and we need to find lots of people who are at risk who are keen to get involved. 
And, and on that um, point, there are moves um, in Germany in particular, but also in the US and, and quite recently in Australia to see if we can go beyond families and actually test everyone in the community. Because as I said, 85% of kids who get type one diabetes do not have a family member. And, um, and therefore, if we only screen family members, we're gonna miss 85% of the kids that are gonna get diabetes. And you know, we're obviously missing a bunch of people who potentially could get involved in these clinical trials and help us get to an answer sooner. So that is something that will evolve in the coming years is, is population screening. It's gonna be vastly expensive. It's gonna be difficult. Um, it's gonna have a bit of blowback maybe from the general community saying, what are you doing? You know, this is, this is unreasonable. It's just causing a lot of stress. But I, I think um, there, there are moves to see if we can get that happening routinely and, and use it to drive the, the advances uh, and, and particularly the clinical trials that we need to tell us how to do this better. Okay, Dr. John Wentworth, thank you so so much for um, for joining us. I could I had so many more questions that I want to ask you, but I will let you go and have lunch or something. Thank you to yeah. everybody who has been watching along and commenting and asking questions. We will have all the information available, so um, it's probably already up there. But please do check in the comments um, and get involved. Go and have a look, have a read. Makes you know you get get involved however you can. I think that that is. Um, you know, really, really important. And, and what's really been highlighted is that, that we need people to actually put their hand up and to participate. But thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing, John. Um, everybody, we will be back. So please do keep an eye out for what we're doing with um, future Facebook Lives on Thursdays at lunchtime. Um, but thank you everybody very, very much for watching. Thanks thank a lot. you. Thanks a lot. <laughs>